At the beginning of this NBA season, it seemed the LA Lakers had all the foundations of a team ready to repeat as champions. They had the best player in the world on their side, a two-way superstar alongside him, and a bolstered supporting cast from a team that had already won it all. All of those things remain true, but today, with a week to go in the regular season, the Lakers are shaping up to face one of the most challenging paths to a title in NBA history in a league rich with contending talent on a team with many unanswered questions remaining. The potential with this team remains immense, but to realize it, they're going to have to navigate four massive obstacles. So today, let's look at what the Lakers have to overcome to make history yet again. Now, the Lakers have a number of questions that remain on their end, which we'll get into, but let's begin by looking at the historically difficult level of competition that they'll have to face to win it all this year. Right now, the Lakers are the seventh seed out west, sitting a game and a half behind the Trailblazers, who also have the tiebreaker on them. That means, with just five games to make up that ground, the Lakers are currently slated to, and will very likely have to, go through the play-in in order to make the actual playoffs. That in itself is an unprecedented challenge. No NBA team has ever had to go through five rounds or win 17 games to become champions. But to me, that's only a small part of what makes the competition they'll face so daunting because I'd be pretty damn surprised if they didn't get through the plan. But once they survive that initial challenge, the Lakers are going to have to go through one of the strongest Western conferences ever. And as a seven seed, they will be tasked with facing Titans immediately. Based on the current standings, the Lakers will most likely match up against the Suns in the first round, an elite two-way team with basketball's best healthy backcourt, who act as two of the game's deadliest closers, and a number of high-level role players around them. Not exactly a typical first-round matchup. Then, presuming they get through that brutal challenge, they'd most likely draw the Clippers, who have a top 25 player of all time, a second star playing some of the best offensive basketball of his life, and arguably the greatest shooting team ever, with eight 40-plus percent three-point shooters on the roster, and a collective three-point percentage that is the best of this century. That is also not a typical second round matchup. Then they'd most likely get the Jazz, a top three team by both offensive and defensive rating that averages the most made threes per game in NBA history and boasts maybe the strongest top seven I've ever seen with a handful of guys who can kill you on any given night in a clear shared identity. Then finally, I'm going to abandon seeding for this one and say, based on my opinion, that their most likely finals matchup is the Nets, who boast the best statistical offense of all time with what may be the best offensive trio ever. So, to win the title, they'd have to beat four of the league's five best teams by record. And in fact, the Nets actually have the worst record of any Lakers opponent mapped out in this path. Collectively, the teams they would face here have won 69.3% of their games this year, which would be the second highest opponent winning percentage any champion has faced since the playoffs expanded to four rounds in 1983. So, if they're going to win the title, they won't get to catch a break. They'll be facing the league's best teams for a couple months straight, and will be facing a level of competition that we've almost never seen before. So, now that we've established who they have to beat, let's focus on the Lakers themselves. As you're probably aware of, their record has lagged behind expectations this season for one reason far more than any other, injuries to their two best players. They started the year 21-7 and before AD strained his calf, which kept him out for a couple months. Then they treaded water for about 15 games until LeBron went down too, when things got really ugly as they've been 9-16 and ever since he went down. After returning from the high ankle sprain that kept him out for over a month, LeBron then tweaked his ankle again and lost to the Raptors last week and has missed the team's three games since, although head coach Frank Vogel said that that's apparently not due to injury. Now, if LeBron and AD are still legitimately dinged up come playoff time, that presents an obvious challenge, but even if they are both pretty much fully healthy, they will enter the postseason having basically not played together as a full team for three months. Winning a title amidst those circumstances is completely unprecedented. If you look at title teams throughout NBA history, their stars have almost always been exceptionally healthy throughout the regular season. Currently, the record for the least combined games played by a title team's top two players, excluding the lockout-shortened 50-game 1999 season, goes to Clyde Nakeem of the 95 Rockets, who played just 107 total games in a Rockets uniform, but only because Clyde was traded there mid-season from the Blazers. And historically, that team is a real outlier. They didn't even gel that well in the regular season, finishing as the sixth seed, and then miraculously went on to win the title anyways. Right now, LeBron and AD have played just 75 combined games and can play at most 85, putting them at by far the smallest number of any star duo to win a title ever, and that includes lockout shortened seasons. It's hard to find years where even one team star missed a significant amount of time and they won the title anyways, but there are a couple examples of that. In 1998, Scottie Pippen played just 44 games for the Bulls, but he almost entirely missed the first half of the season, meaning Chicago had plenty of time to find a rhythm before the playoffs, and they were utterly dominant with Scottie out there, going 36-8 down the stretch with Pippen. 
The only real example of a team surviving a significant late-season injury to a star is the 2018 Warriors, as Steph missed 31 regular season games in the team's first playoff series, and they still won the title, but I think the fact that the Dubs were able to win a whole playoff series without Curry reflects how, with four All-Stars, they were better equipped than almost any team ever to survive a disruption to their continuity. The Lakers are a very different story, and we've never seen a team win a title when their two best players both miss significant time due to injury in the regular season. On the flip side of that, we have seen some famous instances in which teams with clear championship talent didn't have a full season to gel normally and then fell short of the title. Take the 95 Bulls, who played just 17 games with Jordan on the roster before the playoffs, or the 1970 Lakers, who Wilt played just 12 games for in the regular season. Now, I'm not saying either of those teams' shortcomings were specifically because of a lack of continuity, but I am pointing out the correlation and the precedent. My point with this isn't that the Lakers definitively won't have enough time to get it together. My point is just that we've never seen it done, and it's another significant hurdle that they'll have to overcome. Basketball is so much about synergy and chemistry, and LeBron may be excellent at compensating for those factors given his tremendous command of the game, but we can't just pretend that this lack of a tune-up period doesn't matter at all, especially given some of the unanswered fit questions that remain that we'll get into in a minute. Additionally, although I'm not too concerned about this, I will mention that AD has been playing some of the worst, most passive basketball of his career this season. Right now, he's scoring just 21 points per game on below average efficiency and has been less of a consistent dominant force in the paint than ever before. AD's taking three less free throws per game than last year, is attempting just 23.5% of his shots at the rim, by far a career low, and is taking 30% of his shots from mid-range, which he converts at a very poor 36% clip. I'd put it this way. AD is a dominant athletic lob threat and interior presence who can handle and occasionally kill you with his jumper. But when he becomes a jump shooting big, he loses something. Personally, I think his weirdness this year is mostly just a reflection of him coasting, but he's going to have to flip that switch eventually, and he may have to find a way to be as productive as he was in last year's playoffs without also putting on the best jump shooting run of his career as he did last season. So now we know the Lakers are basically looking to do two things that have almost never been done before. That's not impossible, it's just really hard. Let's switch out our historical lens for a second here for a microscope and key in on one very specific Laker who continues to present a massive challenge to the team, Andre Drummond. Drummond is, in almost every way, antithetical to what makes for good basketball in the modern NBA. Offensively, he can be a black hole in the post despite having no skill there, where he ranks in the 26th percentile. At 6'10", 280, he's heavy on his feet and lacks explosive athleticism or any touch that could make up for that, which makes him an ineffective role man, where he ranks in the 10th percentile. He's also basically the furthest thing there is from a floor spacer in today's NBA, having not made a single shot from 15 feet or further out this entire season. Defensively, Drummond has really good hands and is great on the boards, but outside of that, there's a lot of bad. His slow-footedness makes him a massive liability on the perimeter, and without significant vertical ability, he's basically average as an interior defender. Overall, he allows people to shoot 52% when he's their primary defender, a really bad number that means people shoot 2.6% better than their average when Drummond is on them. And his negative impact on the Lakers has been very plain to see. Not only are the Lakers 6 points per 100 worse with Drummond on the floor, period, but he cannot play with AD. In minutes in which Drummond and AD have played together, the Lakers have posted a net rating of minus 10.3, the equivalent of the second worst team in basketball, and have played as by far the worst offense in the league. Meanwhile, in minutes AD has played with Marcus Saul, the Lakers have been excellent, posting a plus 8.8 net rating, which would be the second best in the league, while playing as by far the league's best defense and a pretty good offense. Now, AD and Gasol do have the advantage of having played many of those minutes with LeBron, too, but the fit is rationally just much more favorable. Gasol may be limited at 36 years old, but he can sure space the floor, having made 41% of his threes on the year, which is essential for a Lakers team that is ranked 25th in three-pointers made on the season and 23rd in three-point percentage, and whose two best players prefer to operate in the paint. It just makes sense to stick as many shooters around those two as you can, and Gasol aids in that cause. However, the Lakers did play AD alongside non-floor spacing centers last year, like Dwight Howard and JaVale McGee, and were able to find success, but those guys were explosive athletes who could dominate out of the dunker spot and roll at a high level on offense. Now, when you run LeBron AD pick and roll, what do you even do with Drummond? He's not a slippery lob threat like JaVale or Dwight who you can stick in the dunker spot, the man is 6'10", 280. Last year, Dwight and JaVale caught 103 lobs in total, making for some great offense. This year, Drummond, who scores more points per game than those two did combined, has caught just 15 lobs. If you actively hurt a team's spacing, can't punish defenses with your athleticism, don't have any discernible offensive skill, and can't make good decisions, what are you out there for? 
Gasol has also been significantly more effective than Drummond defensively, holding opponents to about 47% shooting when he's the primary defender. At this point, he's not ideal as a 5 either, as a real slow poke himself, but he's still a superior post defender to Drummond in my opinion, with good feet and length, a stout frame that's difficult to move, and a higher defensive IQ and better shot blocking instincts than Drummond. Pretty much, there's nothing the Lakers do better when Drummond is on the floor than when Gasol is. They don't even rebound well. In fact, they've been out-rebounded when Drummond and AD play together, which cannot be said for Gasol and AD. Not only is Drummond not good, he's a disastrous fit next to LA's second best player, and yet he's getting 25 minutes per game while Gasol struggles to consistently crack the rotation. The last few games have been promising as Gasol's been playing nearly 15 minutes a game, but that's not good enough. He should be starting, no question, and Drummond should be barely getting on the court. And to anyone who says, well, what if this is just because we haven't seen Drummond with LeBron yet, here's what I'll say. There are things you can say Drummond wouldn't do alongside LeBron. For example, with LeBron out there, hopefully he understands the hierarchy and cuts out the hideous post touches, but he's not suddenly going to get more athletic and lighter on his feet, is he? Habits can change, but traits don't, and Drummond's traits are a massive problem. I'd also say LeBron and just the general incentive to play winning basketball make pretty much anybody look better, but we've seen Gasol, JaVale, and Dwight without LeBron, and I take them all over Drummond. So to me, it's not even about figuring out how to integrate Drummond anymore. It's about accepting that you shouldn't play him significant minutes, and once the Lakers can do that, they'll be in a much better spot. I think we've addressed the biggest issues the Lakers have to overcome, but there's still a couple questions that remain unanswered that we'll sort of lump together here. First off, will they shoot the ball well enough? As I said earlier, the Lakers are just 25th in three-pointers made this year and 22nd in three-point percentage. In an era when nothing is more important than shooting the ball, that certainly makes things tougher, but the Lakers were able to survive mediocre three-point shooting in last year's playoffs, so they could very well do it again. Still, it's definitely something to watch, because an untimely dry spell from beyond the arc could kill them given the tight margins they'll likely be dealing with facing so many strong teams. The other thing the Lakers need to find is a third real difference maker. Last year, after a dismal regular season, Rajon Rondo was that guy. He was incisive getting to the cup, shot the ball remarkably well from beyond the arc, and was, as always, a playmaking savant. Without Rondo to carry the offense in those non-LeBron minutes, things would have been a lot tougher for LA. Now, I fully expect Dennis Schroeder to fill that role at a much higher level than Rondo did last year, but we're going to have to see that happen with no real tune-up period as Schroeder is currently unavailable due to COVID protocols. The Lakers have been excellent when Schroeder, AD, and LeBron all play together, outscoring opponents by 12.4 points per 100 possessions, but Schroeder never totally found his footing playing alongside LeBron. In LeBron's absence, Schroeder went crazy, as he was able to establish himself as the team's primary ball handler, shooting the ball much better on higher volume, and having a much more pronounced playmaking impact. We've seen Schroeder perform well in an off-ball role, for example in OKC's deadly three-guard lineups last year, and he's more than capable as a catch-and-shooter, but his quickness and ability to get downhill is his greatest weapon, and it also empowers his playmaking, and to maximize that, he needs to have the ball in his hands. There should not be a minute of a playoff game where neither LeBron nor Schroeder is on the floor, and if their minutes are staggered to allow that to happen, I think we get the difference-making Schroeder who can also close alongside LeBron and AD. This kind of falls in with the continuity concerns too, because it's very strange to not know what that rotation is going to look like so close to the postseason, but that's the world we're living in with the Lakers right now. So, this is about as tough of a path to a title as you could draw up, but do I still think it's possible for the Lakers? I really do. With their original starting five on the floor, the Lakers have played as the league's best offense and by far its best defense, outscoring opponents by 13.2 points per 100. When AD and LeBron play together, they've actually performed much better than they did with those two out there last season, and we saw the team's offensive production as a whole take a leap in last year's playoffs as compared to the regular season. To me, there's no indication that those things can't all happen again, but the margins are slim right now, and nothing is certain. In last year's playoffs, the Lakers made a couple things apparent. LeBron was the best player in the world, AD was the best he'd ever been, and this was an all-time duo. Now, it's time for them to re-establish those truths and prove that it's enough for them to overcome everything that they're facing. And if they can do that, we're looking at an all-time great accomplishment. We'll have our answers soon enough. To those of you who have made it this far, thank you so much for watching. As always, I hope you've enjoyed. If you have, we've got plenty more content like it. That's the good news. We do a couple podcasts on the NBA a week, which you can check out on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your stuff. We've also been posting a lot of the full episodes here to YouTube recently, so you can stick around and watch some of those, or you can check out more of our video breakdown stuff. I just did a video on the most controversial MVP races from 1995 to 2003. Before that, I did one on Jason Tatum. My buddy Logan, who I do my podcast with, is coming out with another one on the NFL soon, so stay tuned for all 
all of that. And then if you want to keep up with what we're doing, follow us on Twitter at nerd underscore sesh and on Instagram at nerd sesh. You can find some cool video content from the podcast, some graphic content, and really just stay plugged in to what is up in the nerd sesh world. And with that, as always, guys, thank you so much. Hope you've enjoyed.